You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. What a beautiful day for horses in the morning. You are listening to the number one horse podcast in the world. Here is your entertaining look at the horse world and the people in it. I'm Julie Broadway, president at the American Horse Council. And I'm Megan Arsman, marketing and communications specialist for the American Horse Council. And you are listening to the special monthly American Horse Council episode of Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network for Tuesday, February 6th, 2024. Good morning, Horse World. It's time to hear from the American Horse Council in this monthly episode of Horses in the Morning. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Megan, I can't believe that January has just flown by. Wow, where did it go? I know, right? It's it's really crazy. And now we're into February and the shortest month of the year. <laughs> well, we're excited to bring on Tom O'Mara with the United States Equestrian Federation, which is the governing body uh, of the United States Equestrian Team and many equestrian uh, sports and disciplines. Uh, it just it seems like just a few weeks ago that the United States Equestrian Federation held its annual meeting and convention, and the theme of their event this year was The Future is Now. So we are really looking forward to talking with Tom, learning more about what USEF uh, is up to, what their priorities are, what they're going to be working on for 2024 and beyond. Um, now, if you're Jane Smith from Oklahoma City, who's just a casual trail rider, and you're already mucking the stall this morning, and you're listening to this podcast, and you're thinking, what? why do I need to be learning more about the United States Equestrian Federation? I'm not even a member. I'm not even involved in them. Well, mm-hmm. I'm here to tell you that a lot of things are happening around the globe in the Mm -hmm. space of equestrian industry. And I anticipate that we're going to see some of those changes come to the U.S. and they'll probably come through the uh, FEI and through USEF and then ripple out into other breeds and disciplines and just go uh, all over um, our industry. So stay tuned and we're going to learn a lot about what's going on and some of the new things uh, that uh, USEF is embracing for 2024. Right, definitely. There's always everything going on, and it does start with USEF when it comes to competitions and things here in in the U.S. So I'm excited, and this should be a great conversation, so let's get right to it. Tom O'Mara is a, currently the president and chairman of the board for the United States Equestrian Federation, or the USEF. Tom has been on the board for eight years now and came on originally as an independent director. Tom's career has spanned nearly 30 years in the financial services industry, where he worked for a number of investment banks on Wall Street, where he traded, managed risk, and helped build new businesses in their capital markets divisions. While Tom was doing this, his wife Liz introduced their four children to horses. Oh, that's always that's always a bad thing. And the family (laughs) became very involved as junior riders in the hunter jumper disciplines. The family's passion has now become Tom's passion, and it's because of them that this horse show dad from the finance world is now the president of USCF. So it's a, definitely a gateway drug for sure. So thank you so much for coming on, Tom. Thank you, Megan. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Tom, I'm always delighted to have the chance to and the opportunity to chat with you because you're just a wealth of information. I know this year's theme for the uh, convention was The Future Is Now. Talk a little bit about why you guys chose that topic, why it's an important message. You know, what is it you're trying to get across to USEF members, fans, even non-members that you think is important for them to understand about why the future is now? Well, thanks, Julie. It's great to be uh, here having a conversation with you about this. Um, There's lots of things, uh, you know, on the horizon. And um, we always say that phrase, right? Lots of things on the horizon when, in fact, the themes that we've had each year uh, when U.S. Equestrian holds its annual meeting, we try to uh, have a theme for it. And uh, especially for uh, delivering the message of what we're going to be doing in the upcoming year. Um, and, And we have this great general session that is presented and I always say to people, it's great not because Bill Maroney, the CEO, and myself present it. Uh, it's great because it's the best one hour in, uh, in that I believe someone should spend to uh, learn about what the Federation does for 
its members and what it's going to do for the next year. Um, so I recommend people look at that. You could go to our website and pull up the uh, general session from our annual meeting. It's really uh, in a, a, a great one hour uh, review. I know that when I first sat in that room, when I was not delivering the speech, but listening to it, uh, when I first became a board member eight years ago, uh, my predecessor, Murray Kessler, stood up and gave uh, a presentation. And he had every department head come out and explain what their department does and what they did this past year. <clears throat> and it was fantastic. I, I, I immediately realized that was an important thing to focus on. So when we do that, we kind of have a little bit of a theme around it. And uh, when I came in th three years ago now uh, to start as president of the Federation, you know, we had a strategic plan uh, that the board of directors uh, sat down and, and creates and works with consultants. And we have some phenomenal people on our board, uh, very uh, uh, intelligent, uh, well-versed people from all walks of life, men, women, equestrian professionals, independent directors, uh, athletes, very big part of it are athletes, Olympians, uh, non-Olympians, you name it. Uh, just a lot of participation and experience that comes to the table. And we walk through that strategic plan. And 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 that's really what the board's job is, is to uh, uh to set the strategy for the for the for the federation. And my job as the chairman of that board is to run the board meetings, but is to uh, as president, I actually make sure that the board's strategic plan and vision is being uh, affected by uh, the CEO of the organization, Bill Maroney. So, um, you know, uh, um, the the theme around this is always very important because um, it, it kind of ties into the stages and the progress of our strategic plan. So when I first stepped in, and I, I have a piece of paper written down here on my screen, which I always thought was really great. Our The theme my first year was listen, learn, and lead. Mm. And um, I thought that was a great one. Listen, our marketing department comes up with these great terms. Uh, Vicki Lowell's our chief marketing officer and head of content and whatnot. And, and, but that was important when I came in because there was a lot of issues going on at the time. Uh, there was a lot of people <clears throat> trying to figure out what it was that the Federation was doing, how we interacted with our affiliates. Uh, and, and, you know, when I literally stepped in, I think we were uh, embarking or COVID had been running its course for about six months at that point, maybe nine months. And it was, uh, there was a lot of disgruntled people. So we decided to sit down and listen, learn, and then lead. Um, so that was the theme that year. And then the next year or two, I think we went into working for the future. And uh, what all this ties uh, about is like, we listened to what issues were, we listened to what people wanted from the Federation, we listened to where they wanted the sport to go um, from whatever breed or discipline you're from. And then we kind of created the next step was getting the building blocks in place to be able to do that, to affect that, uh, all within the framework of our strategic plan, which also happened to tie in with it as well. And that's why this year when I walked in in December, I was on a call with our marketing department. And I said, so what's the theme this year? And I said, well, you know, we keep talking about getting things ready, listening, learning, leading, getting things ready to move the sport forward in the future. Well, you know what? It's all a lot of that has been put in place. So the future is now. And I know long winded, uh, Julie, you, you've sat in rooms with me and I can get long winded with some of these conversations. But that's really how it came about. And I wanted just to give a little background on, on, on to this. We've done a lot of work. We, the Federation, all of our members, everybody we interact with, organizers, owners, riders, you name it. Um, and I think we have done a lot to really start talking about the future is today. And, um, you know, and that ties into how I was opening up, like, it's time to start really thinking about it. And one of the issues, which I think you also want to talk to, is we got to be very careful, we want all these things to be in place and done right. So as we move our sport forward, which I always talk about growth in our sport, you know, there's a lot of responsibilities that come with that. And, you know, that told, ties into, uh, you know, the social license to operate, which um, is, a, is, you know, it's, it's a new buzzword, but not really a news buzzword, because if you haven't been focused on it, whether you're an industry or a corporation or uh, a government, if you haven't been focused on that in the last hundred years, you know, you might have missed some people who've had some difficulties not dealing with it and they don't exist any longer. So it's a, it's an important thing to recognize. Well, you're exactly right, Tom. You know, I do a lot of uh, public speaking about what we do in Washington, D.C., about the American Horse Council and all the programs and about the state of the industry. And social license to operate is one of my top 
topics uh, because it's so um, important that um, the entire industry understands the optics of the industry, that they understand how the public perceives us, that they they get that um, that grasp of what's going on. So, you know, I know that was one of your messages front and center this year, too. Um, what are some some examples of things that United States Equestrian Federation, American Horse Council, the equestrian community can do to ensure that we have that social license to operate? What do we be, need to be mindful of? Well, that's a great question. Um, the Federation, we started actually at the previous year's convention is when we launched a workshop. Uh, David O'Connor, uh, former president of the Federation, former Olympian. Um, I guess, I don't know if you're ever a former Olympian. I think I should just say Olympian. <laughs> um, uh, but David, uh, <clears throat> he was there at the beginning of the USCF when it was formed in this iteration uh, in 2003 and around that period of time. And, um, you know, there was a lot of great work that needed to be done. Talk about it, putting building blocks in position, you know, with uh, with all the things that were happening 20 years ago uh, with the uh, governing body of the sport. Uh, he did a lot of that work. And um, uh, so it's been great having him back. And I'll tell you a quick background. He's now the director of sport. So he oversees chief of sport. Um, and it's something that I observed and went to our board uh, and thought that we were kind of missing. And, you know, I'm not into big bureaucracies, whatnot, but I did th believe that we were missing a, a kind of a layer because our CEO is stretched. He had 12 direct reports at the time. And two of them, one was the head of national sport, one was the head of international sport. And honestly, there was a lot of new initiatives that our members have talked about, like, can we do this? Can we do that? Our affiliates always want to do more. And, you know, I kept going in the meeting saying, hey, how come we're not doing more? Let's do these new things. People are interested in something, another program, whatever it's going to be. Um, and I got a diff and I learned because I listened and then I learned um, <laughs> even internally, not just externally. But what I learned was everyone had, you know, their their dance cards were full. These people were working their tails off um, on behalf of the Federation, whatever the role was. So asking them to do new things was you know, not met with, uh, not, they agreed. They thought it was exciting that there were new things to do. And uh, it just, it, 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 they didn't have the bandwidth to execute them or, or and move them forward. So what I realized was, and, and sometimes I kind of felt like the national side of our sport and the international side of our sport, although they understood because they set it under the same roof, what was going on in the other side of the house, uh, there wasn't perfect coordination and it was just difficult to do. So what, I, I, we talked to the board and we went to Bill Maroney and he agreed. We, we decided we needed to bring someone in, a director of sport. And actually, we streamlined Bill's direct reports from 12 to about four right now, one of them being the director of sport. And um, so who can do that job? That was an important find, by the way. Uh, you can't just hang out in RFP and say, who wants to apply to be director of sport? You have to find someone who's respected by both the national sport, the international sport, and all the people and constituents and 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 uh, other parties that we uh, interact with, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, the USOPC, the FEI on the international front, and there's not a lot of people who have uh, been you know identified by all these other organizations as someone that they really like to interact with. And so when I said to Bill, we're not going to hang up a sign or a shingle looking for this role, we're going to recruit for this role. I said, who do you think we wrote down what it took to do it? Who do you think fits this? And they really were very, it was short one list. person that we thought of it was a short <laughs> list. And now the key was we had to sit him down for a nice dinner in uh, Lexington and talk him into it. I was going to say, you had um, to persuade him to take that, <clears throat> that role on. <laughs> but, you know, it was interesting when we talk about putting things in place. We uh, we talked about our vision and the strategic plan that the board had set in place and Bill was affecting. And David looked at us both and he said, you know, that's all the stuff that we dreamed of 20 years ago doing. But there was so much work that had to be put in place before we can actually start moving down that path. So the great news is um, he said, I'd love to, I want to come back because now I get a chance to help do some of the fun stuff on the back end. Uh, the new programs and whatnot. And we have a lot of things in the pipeline that he's been focused on. But um, I don't know. I'm kind of a amateur historian. So I always say to people, my, uh, uh, and, and David knows I call him this every once in a while, but there's only one president in the history of the United States who came back and served, you know, in Congress afterwards to 
do more good work. He was a congressman, became president, and went back to Congress, and that was John Quincy Adams. So uh, every once in a while, when I see David and we're in a group, I call him, you know, Quincy or John Quincy. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of our inside joke, though, because I talked him into we talked him into coming back. He was president, and now he's back as director of sport, doing uh, really important work for our sport. So David, one of his initiatives that we uh, talked about was um, starting to have conversation about social license um, because it's it's clear a big part of our strategic plan, and I've said it a few times already, is growth. And what do we mean by growth? Um, it's, it, it's something I observed uh, in 20 some odd years as a horse show dad. Um, you know, our sport is phenomenal. And people who are in our sport, all the people probably listening to this today, people who love horses, uh, you know, you could define sport any number of ways, but people who love horses, I would say, which is a huge number in the United States, people who love horses. Uh, it's not how many people compete in the Western world and polo and in the English uh, or the breeds or the disciplines, but it's how many people love horses. And it's a big number. Um, so, so, Tom, pause right there a minute so I could tell you the new National Economic Impact Study is coming out. And I, I, can, know. I can tell you what that number is. That number is 39 million households contain a horse enthusiast. That's, that's higher how than big the number, number I would go on with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's phenomenal. So I've been saying 30 million people because there were two surveys in the past. One said a third of all households, which is about 30 million households. So that's 39 million. And the other one, somehow someone came up with 27 million people. This is a five-year-old number, six-year-old number, but 27 million people in the United States sat on the back of a horse that year. Um, which is important, right? There's only, well, you also have the numbers and how many horses are there in the survey? Yeah. So it, we went slightly down from where yeah. we were in 2017, but we're still really strong, but all the economic numbers, and I don't want to get sidetracked, but all the economic numbers are up. I mean, yeah. jobs yeah. are up, value added to the economy is up. Lots and lots of things are up. Well, I was only going to po point out 27 million people sat on the back of the horse. There's not 27 million horses. We know that. So a lot of them are doing <laughs> extra duty. And a lot of that is trail riding and people getting an opportunity when they can, when mm -hmm. they can get around a horse, they can, they, they want to get on one. So, so to me, the real goal is uh, the growth um, and the federation, the USEF anyway, the, uh, the growth is about connecting with people who love horses about the horse. I mean, our, our vision statement is to uh, bring the joy of horse sport to as many people as possible. So I always said the first part of the, that vision statement is one of the building blocks to, to bring the joy of horse boats. How do you bring it to them? You know, it's through connecting with them with media and all these other different mechanisms that we're bringing the joy of horse to. And to me, the second part has really the, been the focus of my first term as president to as many people as possible because they love horses. And what I do think our sport has missed out on for many years is, and it ties in, there's a reason for this, but I always say our sport's kind of inward looking, meaning um, we focus on our sport a lot, the people who are in the sport, doing the sport, whatever, in whatever capacity, but also those who govern the sport. Um, you know, years ago, the organization that oversaw a lot of sport horse was called the American Horse Show Association. And I always tell people, think of that. It was horse shows were kind of overseeing the sport because um, that was the business model. Have people go to a barn and ride and train, and you know, there's 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 a, a business there, or have people go to a horse show and there's a business there. Um, so as long as you get people to come in there and run your business, that was great. So people focus on getting people to come in and ride at a barn at a show. Um, but to me, our sport, uh, one the, one of the things I observed, and this is kind of what I did in my financial career was kind of uh, relative value and looking at comparative analysis between different companies. But now I was looking, walking around horse shows, thinking about our sport from that perspective, um, from a horse show perspective to other sports. And as I did that, I realized the biggest difference was uh, we're not a mainstream sport. Technically, there's only like three or four mainstream sports, but there are a dozen of what we call alternative or the media world calls our alternative sports, which are thoroughly enjoyed by people as fans. Like you don't have to do the sport to, 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 to like it. Um, and then, uh, so I, I, you know, as a horse show dad, I went to a couple of conventions or I listened to them or I read about them and the theme kept coming up. Everyone kept talking about the barriers to entry of our sport, their costs or the location or, or proximity to animals and people living in cities. There's not as many horses there as there used to be. And, you know, I, I used to think to myself, 
uh, that's true. If you only want people to sh ride a horse or show a horse, that's important. And those barriers are certainly there. Um, and, and I don't think there's there's a lot of different ways to you know to do that. So I don't think there are uh, overwhelming barriers to begin with. Uh, you know, to do it at certain levels, it might be. But uh, but even then, there's plenty of examples where people figure out how to get it done. But to me, the sport was exciting. Right, my whole family was showing horses, not me. I was walking around, you know, holding you know lead buckets. ropes and <laughs> buckets and getting water for the kids for the horses and uh but I loved it and I saw how many people loved it and we know how many people in America really do love it so they don't know about the sport enough so to me our job was to bring the joy to as many people as possible so that's really been my initiative now I, we I we we touched on it a little bit earlier uh uh, with a social license. As you do that, you start exposing the sport and we're actively trying to bring more people in under the umbrella of the federation or any horse organization. You know, this isn't just something I think is important to our sport, but if we could touch base with 39 million people and get 1 million of them or 2 million of them, you know, an ability to focus or watch us, um, I think that's really good. As long as everybody in the sport uh is doing the things the right way right so uh which is impossible to regulate you could say that about any walk of life right i mean mm -hmm. i always point out to people when they get mad about someone violating a rule why don't you stop them i mean we don't have a policeman standing next to a horse policeman standing next to every person who participates in sport and next to every horse so unfortunately uh things get done but what i always point out to people is there's a stop sign or a red light uh, traffic light, you know, at almost every intersection in America. Yet, I we all see people driving right through them on a daily basis. So, um, we we have rules and regulations. Uh, there's a framework of sport. We hope that everyone loves the sport, and they all do. I know they do. But there's times where people just lose sight of it, maybe because they don't think people are watching or whatever. But in today's world, everybody is watching. So that's what is really. You know, I, I don't think I don't know what there is to do as a federation to uh, bring that message any clearer. But as long as we all uh, we want our sport to be great in the future, we want as many people to enjoy it as possible. We're trying to connect with as many people to watch our sport. Let's all just be darn sure that what we're doing every day is, as David O'Connor said in, one, in his workshop last year and again this year, Let's make sure that everything we do with our horses could be done in the middle of Central Park with the whole world watching and everyone would be capiche with it. So that's mm -hmm. really the message. What are we doing specifically? <sighs> the Federation, I don't think we're doing anything, Julie, any more spe specifically more uh, right now than we have in the past. As you know, we have a rule book that's, you know, apparently everyone tells me it's the thickest thing there is in the world. And I always say, you know, we don't make up the rules. Our, our members and our affiliates make up the rules because someone just drove through a stop sign. And we need to put up another rule in there just to make sure they know red means red. You know, that means stop. That color, all colors are red. You know, so you got to go through all the things. So that's why the rules get thick. But um, but what I do think we're doing is um, having people start that conversation. And that's why I love coming on here today to talk to both of you, just to say, once again, there's nothing specific I can tell you about social license other than think about it and think about that one axiom that David always cites. And, uh, yeah, you know, I, th I think other, many people cite it. Turn your love of horses into savings with equine discounts through the NTRA. Purchase through equine discounts and receive great savings on well-known brands like John Deere, Sherwin-Williams, Big Ass Fans, Farmers Insurance, and Office Depot. Join thousands of other equine members and support companies that give back to the industry we all love. Call 866-678-4289 or visit equinediscounts.com to start saving today. When I used to work on Wall Street, I remember we had, back in 1994, we had all this um, uh, the different training seminars, how to work with each other and treat each other, our, our fellow workers, uh, you know, our customers, whatever. Um, and uh, I remember a lawyer standing up right in front of a whole group of us in an auditorium. She held up the New York Times and she said, listen, if what you just said can't be written on the top fold of the New York <laughs> Times and your grandmother's reading it, your grandmother and be proud of you, then you should be thinking about it. So that's kind of an axiom follows on to what they're talking about. If you train whatever you're doing with a horse, if you could do it in Central Park in front of the whole world, 
then we're all on board. But I think that's what we've started. And when I asked David, um, and he did some great work with a lot of our affiliates since the 20, since the previous annual meeting, there were five questions that they sent out to affiliate leadership, all, all the different breeds and disciplines, and said, and it basically was, you know, the Federation doesn't want to dictate this. We just want people to start conversations. So he asked them, what do you see as the biggest fears? What do you see as an issue? Where do you see your sport in five years and 10 years? Um, and, and as more people learn about it, whether we get more people to follow the U.S. Federation, uh, my goal through media or social media and whatever mechanism that is or not, everyone in the world has a cell phone and is filming everything we do with horses. Yep. So um, whether we grow the number of participants and number of horses in our sport, there's still going to be more eyeballs on our sport. So I like them to be good eyeballs. Um, and, 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 and that's all I can say. So that's a, uh, you know, funny for me to say that that's all I can say, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I will tell you that again, I talk about social license to operate a lot, but I have noticed in the last several years that a lot of people um, from different um, perspectives, different um, um, jobs in our industry are talking about social license more. I think that the term has become more known. Mm -hmm. um, and when I look at the my conference lineup for this year, Tom, I, almost every conference has got somebody talking about social license to operate. If it ain't me, they've found somebody else. And that's great because I really think it's raising that awareness. It's educating people. It's making them think about these things. That's right. and, and I go back to, you know, some of the things that we've implemented in the industry um, in broad terms that initially people were like, why do we need to do this? What What's the point of this? And it took a while, but, uh, you know, and I'm going to be honest, like Safe Sport. I mean, when we started Safe Sport, there were a lot of people who were really skeptical about what was yeah. the need for this. That's now right. I look at where we are and how widely accepted it is and how people understand the importance of it. And I think this is the same thing with social license to operate. No, you're 100 percent correct. Obviously, and and it's the the evolution of safe sport is a perfect example. I mean, you know, the equestrian world. Some parts of it were totally embracing it from mm -hmm. the get go. Like, why didn't we do that? Um, by the way, that's what we were doing in 1994 in those auditoriums <laughs> back in the financial world, mm -hmm. where they were. T t that's what they were t t talking to us about was safe sport. Um, it was it was it was safe work. It's the same thing. Um, and we had to take that testing, by the way, every year. And I happened to become a, a manager in a couple of other regions around the world. So I would have to visit those. And I had to take the testing in every region just because I was a manager or had, uh, you know, certain responsibilities all around the world just to be compliant. So I took safe work five times a year for <laughs> many years. So um, it's it's part of, you know, the way the world is. And But a lot of people, what happened was... Obviously, there was some uh, horrible things happening uh, to young people in particular in other sports, in all sports. And, you know, that's what it took. It took, you know, I remember watching uh, the Nasser verdict with that judge. And I always remember, I forget the numbers, but I think it was 62 victims uh, mm -hmm. that were willing to personally walk up in front of that judge that day on a sentence day and make a statement. And I thought, God bless these young women. And, uh, um, and that's what it took for the, uh, our, our U S government, the U S Congress looked at that. And when they first passed the act, listen, things are going to go through adjustments as, as all things do. But, um, I, and you know, this was in a highly, um, contentious political environment that we've been in it feels like forever now but for probably the last eight years but i remember that u.s and and you know as much as anyone with the american horse council you guys deal with the house and, and the senate all the time with with our government how often did you ever see something get passed the, to the extent that that's uh protecting uh minors act did back then no. there are you guys will correct me on the numbers well i know we have the easy ones 100 senators but 430 something congressmen so mm -hmm. it's 530 people well you know this is what people always would come to me why are we doing this i said well you know if you, we're just following the federal law now if you have an issue with it i suggest you talk to your congressman or your senator i said but i do just want to point out to you that um when they took the vote out of 535, I think it is, total senators and U.S. congressmen, the vote was 533 to two. I mean, there's never been uh, an overwhelming um, 
Now, maybe they rushed into it because it was so overwhelming and there's some things that have been adjusted, which has been great. But you're right. Safe sport was just one of the first parts of it. And I do see wherever I go, people are like, yeah, of course we're for that. And you know who re- doesn't even hesitate when you talk to them about that? Are young people, by the way. They're oh, like, yeah. Yeah. What are um, you all talking about? And when you talk about social license, young people are like, yeah. Yeah. Well, we got to do things. So um, so I do think everyone now, it's on the tip of their tongue. And I guess it'll get as annoying uh as a term, uh, social license is any other term, but um, but it's important. And I'm glad to see it. So what I like to see is when I don't have to start the conversation about it, when I go to an affiliate convention, and I'll tell you this past year, affiliates of the USEF, many of the breeds in particular, came forward. Their boards of directors, with n- no mandate from us, just us talking about this all the time, but their boards of directors, their members, ask their boards and their leaders and their executive directors or CEOs or what, whoever it is running these these groups, we need to do a couple of things about our sport. And uh, a lot of them were about athlete and equine wellness and safety and all those types of things. And the rules that I think came through this year, through the process from affiliates, were asking for things that I don't think would have been asked in the past. And I do believe that those are very real responses to people saying, my God, should I be doing this with my horse in the middle of Central Park? Should I be doing this with uh, with one of my students in the middle of Central Park? Well, these are all the same questions. And I think it's really, really remarkable. So they've come forward. They're asking for a little framework around some things that maybe didn't have as strong of a framework around them in the past. And that's happening. So there's collaboration already happening uh, amongst our affiliates where when I first and I sat on the board for four years before I became president. I didn't see it happening then as much. Um, and I think that evolution is happening. So I'm really excited about that. So when, uh, the other thing, I've gone to conventions of our affiliates this past December. One week, I was in two of them, one in Charlotte and one in, where was I, St. Louis. And um, they held their own seminars on social license. Mm-hmm. And they said, and oh, I went to the FEI General Assembly, which <clears throat> for your listeners, the FEI is the International Federation, I think it stands for, I know it stands for Federation Equine International, Federation Equine International, yeah, FEI, based over in Switzerland. And they have, every year they have um, a general assembly. And the only members of the FEI, by the way, are the national federation. So um, a a number of us, our senior staff and myself, uh, attend these. And um, it was in Mexico City this past, I think that was in middle, end of November. and when we go there, they're talking about social license around the world. And you can see some countries are all over it. Some countries haven't even started discussing it yet. So, um, but it's all going that direction. And the FEI is trying to help them all. As you know, they started a welfare uh, commission two or three years ago to start, two years ago to start really working on this as well. And we had a member of that commission come and presented our fed- our federation's annual meeting this year. So it's just conversation, uh, looking at it. I think they do surveys and you'd be shocked. People, not just non-equestrians, but equestrians believe many things that are common practice need to be changed. So we'll see how it works out. Definitely. It's, it, it's all about being responsible for yourself and responsible for, for those around you as well. Um, so it's really interesting. I love listening to listening to all that and everything and, and, and just, you know, hearing about how you guys have always been on the forefront of doing that. Uh, so, the, so Tom, the USCF is the national governing body for equestrian sports, but not all equestrian sports are under the USCF. Correct. One of your topics was, um, a collaboration. So talk a little bit about USCF's effort to work with non USCF affiliates. You know, you guys are the national governing body Mm -hmm. for, you call it sport, but then there's the others, um, disciplines and such that are not under your guys's umbrella. So can you talk a little bit about your effort to work with them? Yes. Yes. So it's great. I'm glad you picked up the collaboration was one of our themes in our annual meeting. And it's in it's in the general session. There's a whole little uh, set of slides (laughs) about the various uh, successes of collaboration over the past year. And hopefully they just continue. I just mentioned a few uh, what I will say internal collaboration, which means uh, amongst the affiliates that are under the umbrella of the USCF. So for your listeners. Um, your point is spot on. You know, the USCF is the national governing body of sport. And what does that mean? 
were designated as such by the USOPC, the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And they uh, have the authority to do that. Um, oh, by the way, there are 52 national governing bodies of sport in the United States. Okay. So just think of a deck of cards. So we're one of them. We're the one for equestrian sport. And there's baseball, softball, mm -hmm. volleyball, all the different governing bodies. Um, some are very large. Some are not so large. We actually are, are closer to the top end in a lot of different metrics. Um, but the... Um, the USOPC uh, gets its authority uh, to, to determine national governing bodies by uh, a federal law called the Ted Stevens Amateur Sports Act, which is a very complex act, but one of the parts of it designates uh, the need for an NGB. And an NGB, the purpose of an NGB, one of the purposes of an NGB is to make sure that we create opportunities in the entire country for horse sport from the grassroots to making sure we have um, representatives of the United States in international competition as well. And that's why these NGBs roll into the USOPC because it does have to do with international competition as well as grassroots. Now, um, it's the full responsibility of the USEF to worry about the international side of it, but the grassroots we share with our affiliates and actually they do much of the legwork when it comes to that. So underneath the US equestrian Federation underneath our umbrella, there are 28 breeds and disciplines. Seven of those disciplines are the FEI, the international disciplines. Three of those are Olympic and the other four are international, but not Olympic. Those other four are driving, endurance, para, dressage, para dressage, and vaulting. Um, and of course, the three Olympic disciplines, so everyone on the call gets that is uh, jumping, dressage, and eventing. So those are the seven disciplines that are international. But we have 29 in total. Of those 29, 17 of them currently have an their own affiliate, their own national affiliate, an organization that kind of oversees and, and doesn't govern, but helps create programs and coordinate with us um, on uh, whatever the breed's activities are. And we're the framework for all those. So pick a breed, like the Arabians is the biggest of the breed organization, the Arabian Horse Association. Um, you know, they have their own board of governors, governors and they, they have the shows, but we license the USEF license shows. Um, so that's one of the things that, you know, there's a framework that we bring to all these breeds and disciplines uh, that is done at what we call, I call central anyway, which is the federation. So um, that framework includes licensing 20, 300 horse shows a year across all these different breeds and disciplines. And, and we have the rule book, which each breed's rules are in our rule book. Um, we have licensed officials. We have a drug medication programs. We have say sport. Um, and, and we can do all these things for all those different affiliates and breeds and disciplines underneath us. And uh, we have a hearing process, by the way, if you don't like something that goes on at a horse show and you want to bring uh, disagreement against someone, it is heard at the USEF. We have basically a little mini court where people's grievances are heard and, and play out. They don't always go to court. They can be settled ahead of time. But this is all uh, some uh, very, very significant stuff. That's what I always call the framework of sport. And that's what I tell people. Um, uh, that, that's what that's what differentiates equestrian activities. Uh, some of them can be considered part of a national sport, and some of them can be considered not. Right, and if you if if it's not, then a lot of that framework disappears. Now that being said, as you pointed out, there's many parts, there's many equestrians in other uh, disciplines or specialties that are not part of the USEF. And um, then uh, primarily the majority of the Western world is not part of the USEF. So they mm -hmm. have some great organizations that oversees them and they just have their own sets of governance rules, but they're not technically designated you know, legally as an NGB. But you have the American Quarter Horse Association, which is huge, the American Paint Horse Association, the National Reining Horse Association, Cutters, Ranch Horse, you know, there's a million different organizations, which are wonderful. Then you have the whole rodeo world, right? That's not part mm -hmm. of us. That's not part, uh, some of that overlaps with some of the NRHA stuff, but there's the whole rodeo associations, professional rodeo. And then there's the whole polo world, which is not part of us either. That's a separate entity all of, of itself. And then even the breeds and 
disciplines that fall under us, which I call kind of sport horse. Oh, of course, then there's thoroughbred racing and yeah. many other horse mm-hmm. activities, which, by the way, one of the neat things I like to do is sit on the board of trustees of the American Horse Council because um, you guys are uh, representing a lot of us um, uh, in, in in the halls of Congress uh, as our as a lobbyist for us and or an advocate for the horse, no matter where or what organization that people are riding under, which is why the American Horse Council is so important. Um, so all of us, um, not just people under the USEF umbrella, but all those organizations I was just referring to, the racing, the trotters, you name it, um, they're all part of uh, or can get representation through the American Horse Council. Some of them might not be, but most of them are. The big ones that I just mentioned, I think they all are, which is important. So that's a great part of the American Horse Council. You, your organization brings us all together uh, once a year in person, but the board of trustees very often, and there's lots of educational materials and work that you all do in newsletters to connect with people who want to be a member of the AHC. Um, but it's it's, it's vital because that's really a, a voice for the entire equestrian world when it comes to uh, governance, whether it's federal or state governance. So, so that's a great collaboration. We want to talk about collaborating across everything in uh, in horse sport i mean really the american horse council is the only entity that i know that does that so um anyway but your question back to it megan was really like we've got great collaboration within us um you know i'm not going to say it's not my job to 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 uh we we don't govern all these other organizations but we all love horses and Mm -hmm. we you know we all um kind of have the same feelings about what should be done and and really getting to sit down with them. I think we had the AHC in person uh, or your annual convention was in Denver, were we, this past year in yep. June? Yep. And uh, it was fantastic sitting in a room. You all bring in speakers and they speak. And because what's important, the reason we have to collaborate, whether you, you know we are under each other's auspices or not, is because under the social license theory, Whatever happens in one of our groups to the non-horse people in the world, it's the same as all the other horse groups. So if a horse breaks down on a racetrack, you know, I remember when my some of my relatives who are no longer alive, I'd meet them. They're like, oh, yeah, all your, all your horse is dying on the racetrack. I'm like, none of our <laughs> horses even go on a racetrack. Or, um, but, you know, to the non, the majority of people are not equestrians, right? We know that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but, but when something happens in any part of our world, uh, we're, we're all impacted. And I say world, by the way, it's not just in the U S. So when something happens around the world, you all saw the Olympics in Tokyo, um, not the equestrian part of it, which which was pretty much without a hitch, but there's an event called the pentathlon, modern Mm -hmm. pentathlon, right? And they use horses in it. And unfortunately there was a bad (laughs) activity amongst one of the participants at an Olympic Games and um, uh, treated a horse poorly, very bad. And uh, it it, it caused an uproar, and rightly Mm -hmm. so. And the horse is now, unfortunately, um, in my opinion, unfortunately, um, that that the horse part of the pentathlon is going to be dropped uh, going forward. In 24, it still exists, but going forward, they're replacing it with some other activity because the uh, uproar from non-equestrians was so deafening that um, the International Olympic Committee had to take action, either drop the whole activity, pentathlon, or replace the part that was uh, upsetting the people, all based on one person's behavior. Yeah. Um uh, bad judgment at a point one point in time i'm sure that person to this day wishes it never happened believe me most people no one would wish that it did happen but um but it's amazing and this year i was on the phone with uh, a group in australia the australian federation by the way and they were talking about the social license they 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 asked me to speak to them about what we're doing in the united states um after uh after hearing about some of the initiatives that we have undertaken because they're concerned about it and i said so what's concerning in australia and I don't know if you know, but I think it's um, jump racing, right? Steeplechase, mm-hmm. which used to be, which exists in a lot of countries. That was banned in Australia, not because of the pentathlon, but they have the largest horse race, right? Everyone, many your listeners all know about the Kentucky Derby in the United States. Well, there's a thing called the what's it called now? The Cup, the Melbourne Cup, maybe mm-hmm. Melbourne yes, Cup. Yes, Melbourne Cup. 
that's the equivalent of the Kentucky Derby in Australia, yeah. right? It's a major, major race. There was, this is now four, three years after the incident in Tokyo at the pentathlon. There was um, a movement to ban, stop that entire competition from happening. And their motto was NUP to the cup. Um, and it was all based on the pentathlon treatment. So it the, the reverberations of one person's actions globally can have a great, great impact on all of us. So we all need to be aware of it. And um, I'm sure there's not a person who would watch that would think that it was okay. So um, yet people make mistakes and it doesn't mean we should shut down the sport. What we need to do is educate people and make sure um, uh, people who are observing it for the first time understand all the things that happen, uh, the, the good treatment that the horses and the people are getting who are act active in the sport because it's a great sport. So the collaboration uh, with non-USEF groups, I'm, we talk to them all the time. Um, Billy Smith, the he was at the time the executive director. He was director. at the American Pain Horse. Now he's at the National Reigning Horse. All right. Great guy. So um, he called me up one day and said, you know, we've been talking about a lot of stuff at the American Horse Council meetings. Um, Tom, would you mind coming down to Fort Worth? Uh, I'm having a symposium down here with the whole Western world. And he had all the different organizations come in. And he said, I'd love you to come down because we all, what happens in your world impacts our world. So um, it was great. I was the only person sitting up on the stage without a cowboy hat on. I, I didn't, <laughs> they didn't tell me get I you one. was out yeah. of place. Ah, I could have. Yeah. So anyway, I should have just bought one. That was my, so that impacted, right? There was something I didn't think of. Uh, it was a bad impact. It was a bad photo, but. Um, <laughs> you just look shorter than the rest of them. Those, yes. those hats are pretty, are pretty tall. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is, listen, we all want to work together. We don't all have to work together, but by, we all do work together um, because I guess maybe we do have to work together. So I, I just love the, the uh, openness of people who in all aspects and all walks of the equestrian world to want to talk about their horses with each other. So, Tom, I asked this question at our conference this year when we had our Equine Industry Executive Forum. I asked my peers, all the CEOs and the EDs from all the breeds and the discipline groups and everything, okay, what, what is it that keeps you up at night? Mm -hmm. So my question is for you as the board chair at USEF, what what keeps you up at night? What, what's, the, what's the big thing weighing on you right now? Yeah. Well, it's the same type of thing. There's two things I always think of. Um, but they really are de facto the same. And it really is the unexpected um, uh, and the unexpected in two components. One, um, bad behavior by someone in our sport, um, bad behavior, you know, any, any, in any regards and not because it gets known just because it happened. Um, whether, you know, an athlete, uh, it gets in trouble, is abused, or something terrible happens, and it happens. And I, you know, for the life of me, I can't figure it out. But I mean, even in the safe sport world that we're in now, right? Everyone, we everyone gets educated. There are people who are taking the testing. Uh, I mean, just because you're tested doesn't guarantee everyone's safety, but it just raises awareness. Yet people still do some pretty crazy things, um, um, and, and that's putting it lightly. So I just can't believe it. Um, the whole world knows that everyone's looking, watching, waiting, and yet people still behave crazy. So that's not an equestrian problem, by the way. I, I, I'm not saying that <laughs> this only happens in equestrian. This happens everywhere. It's my stoplight and streetlights. Um, yep. uh, it's just unbelievable, right? What people do. It's just human nature. And human nature is good in the aggregate, but yet there's times where people do things and you know, I always say to people, sometimes when they do stuff, you never, you never know what really is making them tick that day, but um, but it happens. So it's it's bad things happening to people in our sport. That keeps me up. Like, I don't want to uh, – I just hope it doesn't. And by the way, this isn't like people being, you know, preyed upon. This is like accidents too. I mean, it's terrible. There, there's, there are accidents, our sport that can happen. It happens in other sports. If I was sitting here in this position uh, as a president of an NGB of another sport, I'd be saying the same thing. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm um, sure we would. Right. Athlete safety is, is, is an important thing. And we have many, many, many um, 
rules, regulations, policies in place to help um, to help minimize uh, or maximize safety, uh, minimize bad things happening. Yet they still happen. So that keeps me up. And the second thing that keeps me up is the other unknown is uh, when it gets and, and this is one of the reasons that all the different horse groups wanted to have a conversation uh, is about biosecurity, right? And this is now safety mm -hmm. of our animals. Mm -hmm. So in the world today. Um, people move about more, horses move about more, and that's what transmits all sorts of things that can, uh, and, and, and they're out of our control some, oftentimes. We still don't know where and how certain things start, but when they pop up, they spread, and we've, and, and then we had to do that with the whole world, right, uh, with humans as well when it came to the pandemic and COVID. But, but I think the response to that. So people, I think, are a little more used to biosecurity. So now, when we say biosecurity, oh, there's an EHV outbreak and wherever, and uh, you know, we have protocols, mm -hmm. and we've worked with some of the other horse organizations on those protocols. They call up, they talk to our scientists that work for the federation, the vets, and they're like, "What do you have?" And um, we even had to double our vet staff from a senior one senior vet to two. And uh, we brought in the second uh, woman is Dr. Katie Flynn, who spoke at the AHC convention because she is an expert in biosecurity. And she was the California state vet and, and one of them. And then she was in Kentucky. Okay. And, and so we said, come on, would you come on board here? Um, so we have protocols and she's been fantastic. She works with organizers. They reach out to her directly when there's outbreaks. We have protocols. In fact, there was a, <clears throat> what was it, vesicular stomatitis. Um, the staff was pretty excited. I said that smoothly uh, without, <laughs> without any prompting at, at our annual meeting, but because I heard about it more than I ever thought I would hear about that in my life, right? Um, and uh, but we had protocols in place based on EHV, and now they differ quite a bit, uh, or somewhat. And she very quickly adjusted them, had the quick calls with the organizers, and you know I think we got our arms around it. And that's a lot different than things were. <laughs> You know, just a few years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 20 years ago, some of the biggest outbreaks were because we didn't, one, the Western, the English, the polo, the racing worlds weren't talking to each other. And something happened to one of them. And all of a sudden, like racehorses are getting EHV at some barn somewhere. And they didn't know where the heck it came from. Or some Western horses in Utah uh, all left the facility and probably shouldn't have. And these are some of the biggest outbreaks that happened. But um, no... No, we didn't have, no one had protocols. No one had, um, and each state, by the way, has their own sets of rules. <laughs> Sounds like a problem, and it is. Um, so, uh, you know, you need a national horse organization and uh, to help kind of, you know, follow that. And now we have technology that's helping, right, with the, the chips and um, that we have in every dog and now many horses, and some groups don't want to put them in, some do groups do but those are actually they have a new technology there's a new version of those which are going to be biothermal chips Thermal, that's right yep and so there's a lot of data that can be done with those that you know all the when you have a biosecurity problem there's lockdown in barns or at a horse show or at a racetrack you know they're running around doing temps twice a day well this will allow them to go by with a some type of um, it's, uh, you it's just a scanner. Write the word. A scanner. Thank a you. Scanner. I was about to say a gun. It's not a gun. It's a scanner. <laughs> One of those things you hold in your hand. Um, but they can pick up the temperatures just walking up and down the aisles. So then there's not even touching, um, uh, you know, the horses and whatnot, and with between a human. And that's the spread. Humans spread these things among horses more than horses do. Um, when when they do happen. So that is the second biggest. Those are the two things: athlete and equine. Um, unexpected events happening to either of those populations. That's what keeps me up. Um, so um, I'm just going to give a shout out, Tom, to Dr. Katie Flynn. Um, I recently spoke at the League of Ag and Equine Centers Conference uh, in Fort Worth, and I was the lead speaker talking about economic impact studies and economic equation of our industry, the inputs and the outputs and all the things that go into that. And Katie followed me by having a presentation on biosecurity. So she she and I tag team those folks to talk about um, all of the economic impacts if you don't have good biosecurity and the, the the possible health impacts if you don't have good biosecurity. And that's not just going to a horse show. That's at home in your local barn. You can't just bring a new horse into your barn and put him in with the rest of the herd and 
just think, okay, he came from a good place. Everything's fine. You gotta, you gotta have a quarantine. You gotta have some other measures in place just to integrate one new horse into the herd. You know, there, so there's there's so many things to think about. So shout out to Katie because she did a fantastic job, good and she has got a great slide deck for anybody out there listening that wants to hear more about all the precautions. Who knew that if you watered a, put a water hose down in a bucket to give a horse water and you pull the hose out and you went down to the next mm-hmm. stall and you put the hose back down into the bucket to the next one, you just spread whatever was from the first horse to the second horse. So mm-hmm. lots of just little small details that I think people just, you know, they take the shortcut or they don't even understand that there's that kind of risk that's there. So shout out to Katie. The, yeah, she's fantastic. I, I got to say, the, you hit uh, the nail on the head with the whole economic aspect of it too. You know, I I, I don't like to listen. It's animal and human welfare is what's most important. But you know, at the end of the day, if we don't all think about these things, uh, because of how fast they travel now, because of the connectivity, it's not just our cell phones connecting bad information, but Again, as I said earlier, horses and people travel a lot more than we used to. And there are horse show circuits that are bigger than they've ever been before. There's, uh, you know, groups of horses and people getting together, I mean, uh, that are bigger and they last for months, a month, some of these things, right? Indoor facilities, right? So you just wonder uh, what what happens about all that. So it's really important because... When 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 there's an outbreak or when something shuts us down, uh, I always think about what happened with the pandemic. I mean, uh, you know, our country had to stop everyone from doing everything. And the only way we were able to do that was because there's a thing called the big federal governments all around the world who actually just unfortunately they had to they had to do this, but they printed money to subsidize us all to do nothing the economy uh, it was done and i mean it, it ran at a small fraction of what it ran at but i mean that is a frightening frightening thing and you know that's not what happens in the horse world but it does in a micro perspective mm-hmm. um when we do shut down um you know there's people making a life i remember when COVID hit there's a local group here in marion county florida um there's a lot of people who their incomes dropped and they have horses in their backyard and um and there was a couple of problems one their income dropped so it was tough to be paying for feed for their families and their horses and additionally um there was not a lot of production of hay as you know remember there was a shortage for a lot of different reasons we didn't have people out working we didn't uh you know it was not a priority and it became a real problem so there was a great group here who just pulled together a lot of people on a volunteer basis to make donations of money and help purchase feed for the people and their horses who were looking for food um and it was just really amazing but boy if when the sport goes the wrong way for biosecurity outbreaks uh, bio outbreaks you know we got to uh it, it's very very expensive and maybe that's why i worry about it um um but yeah the health of all these animals and and the the welfare of the people's ability to make a living the industry is significant and when that just shuts down that's dangerous uh, hey, so I, I don't want to cut you short, but I'm just going to tell our listeners, stay tuned for the next segment because I'm going to do a legislative update and I'm going to be talking about the importance of the farm bill. And a lot of people don't realize, but uh, we, we're running behind on getting the farm bill implemented and mm-hmm. it has a major significant impact, a, a very significant impact on, on our industry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But Tom, we really appreciate you joining us today. This was really insightful. I think uh, hopefully our listeners got a better <laughs> uh, understanding of some of the things that's going on with you guys at the United States Equestrian Federation and how it all ripples across everything that's there. Um, I'm, I think uh, Megan's going to put some contact information mm-hmm. um, out. Um, so if people have for more some more questions uh, for Tom or for um, one of his colleagues at USEF, I'm sure he'll route you to the right person so you can can get up with Dr. Katie Flynn or <laughs> Dr. Schumacher or, or whoever uh, is the uh, the appropriate person. But we appreciate your time so much today, Tom. Can I can I make one final plug here? You can indeed. So for your listeners who are not members of the USEF and listen. 
uh, we used to only have one membership, right? You had to be a competing member, which many of your listeners today are, don't compete in any of the breeds or disciplines under the USCF. But we created a, a new category. It's a fan. Uh, you heard me talking about growing the sport. But if you want to be a fan of the USEF, you're not a member, but you're a fan. You could go to the USEF website and maybe, Megan, you could put that up on the on, oh, yeah. on this somehow. But if people just join, it is free, absolutely free. Um, you, you'll you you'll be able to follow the sport. You will get some emails from us. You can control how many you get whenever they start coming. But you also get all the benefits, you know, some of the discounts and stuff. And you get to access watching stuff on the USEF network. Uh, some part of that is free. It's in front of the paywall. Some of it's behind a paywall. But there's plenty to do and learn about. We have a learning center that's available to people as a fan where they can go on and look at videos about you know, loading horses, doing saddles, bits, all sorts of different great educational. It's a big library, but that's all completely free. So we'd love for anybody who just wants to follow along uh, to our part of the world in sport. Um, listen, I've joined a lot of the other Western organizations as a full member, <laughs> just so I can follow and, and and get invited to their conventions and listen in and, and learn what's going on in those worlds, even though I don't actively participate in them. So I'm just giving you guys all a uh, heads up. If you want to follow along, you can join, join up as a fan of the USEF. And yeah, I've we'll heard. definitely we'll definitely put the links up um, down on our show notes below. So we'll make sure that that's that's included, so our listeners can can do that. And Great. Tom, I heard a statistic today from one of your uh, uh, colleagues at USEF that said the number of fans now exceeds the number of competing members. Oh, big time! That's cool. big time, big time. So uh, lots and lots of people out there following what's going on. So our strategic plan four years ago, when I came in as president, I stood up and said, "We're going to have a million fans." And everyone's like, oh, my God, that's crazy. But we have 400 and something thousand right now. So combined, competing members and fans, it's over half a million. We have a million four unique individuals who follow U.S. Equestrian on one of our 19 social media accounts. So these people have picked up a phone and typed something about driving or dressage mm -hmm. or what, and, and, and continue to follow it. It's not just a one-time thing. So that to your point earlier, there's 39 million households in America who love horses. Well, um, over a million of them are following U.S. equestrian breeds and disciplines right now. So I'd say we have over a million fans, but people who actually sign up as a fan, it's been pretty cool. That's great. Thanks, Tom, again for your time today. We really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you both for having me on board. Thanks, Tom. Here's some great reasons why your nonprofit should become a member of the United Horse Coalition. Through industry collaboration, the United Horse Coalition promotes education and options for at-risk and transitioning horses. Incentives for joining include access to a home for every horse training portal and other educational materials and programs, assistance with promotion, networking with industry professionals, free listings on equine.com, Purina feed coupons, join as a nonprofit or as a support organization. Become a member of the United Horse Coalition today. Find out more at unitedhorsecoalition.org slash become a member. So, Megan, I wanted to let our listeners know a little bit out about a legislative update uh, for this segment. And I'm going to focus on the Farm Bill. Uh, most of you know that the Farm Bill is done every five years. Um, we were really hoping to see the Farm Bill get some traction um, last year because it was supposed to have been renewed, and it didn't. Uh, things got kind of roadblocked a little bit up uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, so right now, we're, we were really hoping for March of this year. Both the House and the Senate Ag Committees are still far from hammering out uh, a draft of this piece of legislation. It is expected to hit about $1.5 trillion. That's a big number, um, mm -hmm. which means there's a lot to discuss. Um, so they're still hoping to move this forward before midsummer. That's their goal. There are about six or eight pieces um, of the farm bill that have a direct impact um, on the horse industry. And those range from um, disease detection, USEF, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture staffing, uh, veterinary loan repayment plans, and a number of other uh, components that go along with that. So we're following it real closely at the American Horse Council. Um, the House Ag Committee Chair, which is G.T. Thompson from Pennsylvania, is really pressing um, for more in the spring. He'd like to see March, uh, but it'll likely slide to April or May. Um, given that we're continuing to see the ongoing government funding battle 
And, you know, one more time, we've got a looming shutdown maybe in March. We'll see how that takes shape. Um, so if you want to learn more about the Farm Bill, about where it's at, how it's moving through um, Congress, and about the components of the Farm Bill that the American Horse Council's really promoting and advocating for, just reach out to us and you'll see our contact information in the show notes. So that's mm-hmm. what I wanted to share, Megan. Yeah, definitely. It, se- it seems like, uh, you know, uh, winter is never ending. Um, you know, we talked about things going by really quickly, except for winter. Winter seems to to slow things down a little bit, and um, hopefully, things start to heat up a little bit in our country's capital, and uh, we get things going. We've we've done a um, we've we've done a nice infographic to kind of share the points that the HC is supporting for the farm bill, and you can see that on our homepage when you go to horsecouncil.org. So thank you guys for joining us today. We want to extend a big thank you to Tom O'Mara from the USEF for joining us. If you would like more information on the USEF and how to join, just look for the notes in the link in our show notes. Julie, what's on tap for next month's podcast? So we're really excited uh, next month because we're going to be discussing uh, equine assisted learning and how it not only helps children, uh, but adults um, as they work through uh, issues or leadership development. Um, There's lots of opportunities um, for integration with horses um, on equine-assisted learning. Um, So that's what we've got coming up in March. Yeah, that'll be fun. I I like hearing about that kind of stuff. So we invite you to join the American Horse Council and earn a free subscription to our monthly newsletter, which shares the latest in all legislative happenings, federal and state, as well as more information that horse owners like you need to know. You can follow the American Horse Council on social media and become a member to help support your beloved industry, both locally and nationally. And you can subscribe to the Horses in the Morning on any podcast player and find all the shows on the Horse Radio Network at horseradionetwork.com. And we're excited to announce that we now have our own RSS feed for our podcast, which we will share on all of our American Horse Council social media channels. So you can see that on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and um, and on Instagram. And we're excited about that. And we we have enjoyed our, our partnership with the Horse Radio Network. So to wrap up, as we like to say, we are hashtag here for horses. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.